that doesn't need to Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your name, O oh God. I honor you tonight, King Jesus. You are the Lord of glory. You are the Prince of Peace. You're the Everlasting Father. And Father, I joy in your salvation. I thank you for your strength, O oh God, and your presence tonight, O oh God, that dwells in the midst. I thank you, Lord God, for your loving kindness, better than life itself. Lord, I come before you right now just giving you honor and praise for who you are. You are the rock upon which we stand, O oh God, and our souls make its boast in you, God, alone, because without you, God, we can do nothing. With you, all things are possible to us who believe. And I believe, O oh God, in the finished work of the cross. I believe in the resurrection life. I believe, God, that you came to seek and to save them that which was lost. I thank you, Lord God, for your presence tonight, O oh God. I bind every demonic force, every spirit of heaviness, every spirit of accusation, every spirit of witchcraft and controlling, manipulating spirits, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. I counsel its assignments right now against the people of the Lord. I decree and declare that their minds are being set free by the power of the word of God. I plead the blood of Jesus against every unclean thought, every unclean lifestyle, O oh God, that does not measure up with the word of God in the name of Jesus, that the people of the Lord begin to see themselves in the light of truth, being transformed, being transfigured, being brought into the image and likeness of who you are as you manifest yourself to us and through us, O oh God, as we learn how to yield, surrender, and release ourselves into your hands. Be magnified, be glorified, be exalted, O oh God, because I give you glory, God. It's about you being magnified, O oh God. Remove the spirit of heaviness, O oh God. Remove the tiredness, O oh God. Remove the sluggishness, O oh God, from the people that will come to hear this word tonight, O oh God. Give them clarity, give them understanding, give them insight into the mysteries of the gospel as we learn how, Father, to hunger and thirst after righteousness that only you can satisfy that you feed us like a shepherd feeds his flock. And then, Lord God, I ask you to forgive us for our sins, O oh God, sins of the mouth, sins of knowing and unknowingly, Father, sins of thought, sins of action, O oh God. 
Purify us, O oh God, by the blood of the Lamb. And then I thank you that we have been forgiven. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We have been sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. And that you, O oh Father, have your God-like way in the midst of us tonight, O oh God. That you receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. And I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight, Rita and LaShonda. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but God is so good. His, his mercy continues to endure forever. His love is limitless. He keeps on doing great things for us. And it's so awesome to know that God is on our side, even when men rise up against us and say all men are evil against us falsely for his name's sake. His presence, his presence is right there surrounding us, encouraging us, strengthening us, empowering us to keep on going on in the name of the Lord. No matter what comes our way, the Bible says that we are to put on the full armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I guarantee that the wiles are going to come, the temptations and the attacks are going to come. But how you perceive them, is how you will overcome them or be defeated by them. It's the choice is up to you to determine within yourself that you're going to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord at hand in the midst of the troubles. So many times we, we get up in the morning and we set our day in motion what we want it to be. Then something comes along to distract it. Something throws a monkey wrench in your plan, and it just messes up your whole day if you let it. But I found out, even in that state of being, it doesn't matter if a monkey wrench was thrown in the plan, I learned how to seek the Lord even in the midst of that and say, God, let your will be done. No matter what comes my way, I'm not going to doubt you. I'm not going to get discombobulated. I'm not going to get dysfunctional. I'm not going to get in a state of confusion, but I'm going to trust you at your word because I know that my life, my plans, my future, my destiny is in your hands. And that's excellent news to know that even in the midst of heaviness, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of a broken heart, in the midst of hardships, it doesn't matter what comes our way. You may be having a heart a hurt and pain right now because you lost a loved one. It doesn't matter because God's love still there in your heart to comfort and give you the peace, the strength, and the power to keep on enduring. Even though it hurts, he'll take the pain and the sorrows because he bore it on the cross for us in our stead and give you joy in, in, in place of sorrow, a garment of praise in place of heaviness. And that's good news to know that God loves us that much to not leave us in our, in our weakened state of being where we feel hurt and abandoned, feel like no one cares about us. But he says, I care more about you than you care about yourself. And can't nobody do you like Jesus. Can't nobody fill your heart like Jesus can. Can't nobody give you such a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory like our Jesus. Amen. I'm excited tonight. I'm excited tonight. I heard some disturbing news this evening. You know, some things that have been going on for a while, you know, dealing with church and people. and It's just so much that when you know that you're on the right track and you're doing things that God has instructed you to do, here come old Slewfoot to try to throw something into the plan to make you miserable, to make you upset, to make you uptight. But in the process, God's grace is sufficient. Because the Bible tells us, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against workers of iniquity, because they will soon be cut down like the grass and wither like the green herbs. You know what? Folk can talk about me. They can slander me. They can put me down. All the stuff they want to do. I really don't care. Because I know who I am. I know what God called me to be. I know who God is to me. And the more I keep pressing forward, the more the enemy going to come to attack. You know why? He has to do his job. But are you doing your job is the question. 
when the attacks come against you. Our lesson we've been talking about last week was doubt and unbelief. And it's a real test of life when the enemy comes to bring things to you to throw you off course. Are you going to buckle under the pressure and give in to anger and hatred and resentment and misery? Or are you going to stand still and then see the salvation of God at hand? In other words, let God fight your battle. Because God can do more against your enemy than what you can do with your mouth. And what we need to do with our mouths is when the enemy comes against us, put a praise on it. Begin to seek the Lord. Begin to magnify the Lord. Begin to taste and see that the Lord is good. It says, blessed is the man that trusts in him. Keep on trusting in God. Keep on believing in God. Keep on standing on the word. And don't worry about how big your enemy is. But know that our God is bigger and greater than our enemy. I want to read something concerning doubt. It says, what does the Bible say about doubt? Doubt is an experience common to all people. Even those with faith in God struggle with doubt on occasions and say with the man, with the man like Mark chapter 9, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Verse 24, Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Some people are hindered greatly by doubt. Some see it as a springboard to life. Another see it as an obstacle to be overcome. The Bible has something to say about the cause of doubt and provide examples of people who struggle with it. Classical humanism says that doubt, while uncomfortable, it is absolutely essential for life. Rene Descartes says if you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life you doubt. As far as possible, all things. This is similar to what the founder of Buddhism said. Doubt everything, find your own light. If we take their advice, we'll have to doubt what they said, which seems rather contradictory. Instead of taking the advice of the skeptics and false teachers, we will see what the Bible has to say. A working definition of doubt is to lack confidence to consider unlikely. The very first expression of doubt in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3 when Satan tempted Eve. God has given a clear command regarding the tree of knowledge and of good and evil and has been specified the consequence of disobedience. Satan introduced doubt into Eve's mind when he asked, did God actually say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? He wanted her to lack confidence in God's command. How many times have you found yourself in that same predicament? Well, you know the word God gave you. You know the command God has given you, the instructions God has given you. But here comes the enemy to make you doubt what God has spoken to you. The prophetic word that God speaks to us, many times the enemy wants us to doubt God's word and doubt God's ability to fulfill that word in our lives. But it's up to you and me as a believer to know God's word without compromising, without a shadow of a doubt, without lacking confidence, without believing in God's word, that what God has spoken, that he can, he's not able to do it. That's what the enemy wants you to believe, that God will not bring you out of your situation. He will not heal your broken heart. He will not remove the sickness and afflictions off of you. God will not do this or do that. Just the same way he tested Eve in the garden. Satan replied with a denial, which is a strong, stronger statement of doubt. You will not surely die. Doubt is a tool of Satan to make us lack confidence in God's word and consider his judgment unlikely. And you and I know today that there's, there's a, a law of, of sowing and reaping. If I sow corruption, the normal law of response in human nature is to reap what I sow. God's word says the same thing. If you sow 
sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. If you sow to, to corruption, you reap corruption. If you sow to righteousness, you, you reap righteousness. So it's the same principle according to the standpoint of the world, but yet it, according to God's word, it's a natural law that takes place in our lives. Lest we think that we can lay all the blame on Satan, the Bible clearly holds us accountable for our own doubts. So you cannot blame the devil for everything that you doubt. You cannot blame the devil for every thought that you think because it's up to you in yourself to believe God's word, what he says to you, what you can and cannot do and stand on your own conviction by the power of the Holy Spirit to believe hope against hope without a shadow of doubt what God has spoken, he's able to perform it. <clears throat> when Zechariah was visited by an angel of the Lord and told that he would have a son in Luke chapter 1, verse 11 through 17. Luke chapter 1, verse 11 through 17. He doubted the word given to him. He logically assumed that he, he and his wife were too old to have children. And in response to his doubt, the angel said he would be mute until the day God's promise was fulfilled. Luke chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. Luke chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. Zechariah doubted God's ability to overcome the natural obstacles. Many people today share the same doubt. Anytime we allow human reason to overshadow faith, in God, sinful doubt is the result. Anytime we allow human reasons to overshadow faith in God's ability, faith in God's word, the result is sinful doubt. Hallelujah. No matter how logical our reasonings may seem, God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. No matter how logical our reasons may seem to be, God has made foolishness out of the wisdom of man. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 talks about how God took the foolishness of preaching and confound the wise. And, and his seemingly foolish plans are far wiser than man's plans. Faith is trusting God even when his plan goes against human reasons or experience. Faith is trusting God, God's plan, God's ability, God's word, even when his plans goes against human reasons or experience. So you may have experienced certain things in your life, but God's plans and his reasonings is greater than your natural reasonings. Contrary Contrary to the humanistic view that doubt is essential to life, the Bible says doubt is a destroyer, is a destroyer of life. The Bible tells us don't lean on the wisdom of man because the wisdom of man will tell you it's essential to have doubt. But God says doubt is a destroyer. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. It says if you need wisdom, Ask our generous God. He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as the wave of the sea and is blown and tossed to and fro. So you got to stand on God's word. James chapter 1 verse 6. James chapter 1 verse 6. The remedy... For doubt is faith, and faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It's the remedy to doubt. God gave us the Bible as a testimony of his works in the past, so we would have a reason to trust him in the present. God gave us the Bible as a testimony to give us a reason to trust him in his word in this present life. 
Then he says, I remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I remember your miracles as, as of long ago. Psalm 77, verse 11. Psalm 77, verse 11. In order for us to have faith in God, we must study to know what he has said. Once we have an understanding of what God has done in the past and what he has promised for us in the present and what we can expect from him in the future, we will be able to act in faith instead of doubt. So once we get a revelation of what God has done in the past, what he's done in the present, and what he can do in our future, then we will begin to act in faith to overcome the spirit of doubt. Doubt is a spirit. It's a spirit from the enemy. And he will always use that as a remedy to counterattack your faith, to get you to doubt God's word. Mo the most famous doubter in the Bible was Thomas who declared that he would not believe that the Lord was resurrected unless he could see and touch him, touch Jesus himself. St. John chapter 20, St. John chapter 20, verse 25 to 28. St. John chapter 20, verse 25 to 28. It says, when he, he later saw Jesus and believed, he received the gentle rebuke. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Hebrews 11 chapter verse 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We can have confidence even in the things we cannot see because God has proven himself to be faithful, true, and able. God has proven himself over and over to us throughout the ages. In our own lives, we can attest how many times God has done something extraordinary in our lives to help us to believe and to stand in his word and to know with confidence that he's able to perform everything he promised. So in our book tonight, we're going to talk about, we're still stemming off of doubt and unbelief, but we're going to go to now doubt is a choice. Doubt is a choice. And the key scripture for this is Mark chapter, I mean Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 18 to 22. Matthew chapter 21, verse 18 to 22. And it says, Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and found nothing thereon, but leaves only. And he said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. So it happened instantly. Then it goes on, verse 20, And when the disciples saw it, they marveled. They were amazed, saying, How soon? Is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do that which was done to the fig tree, but also if ye say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, Believing, believing, ye shall receive it. That is so powerful. When Jesus came into a city, he was hungry, and he came to a fig tree, a tree in the season where it should have been bearing some fruit, been productive. But he found that tree lacking fruit, it found it lacking the ability to produce fruit. So he cursed that tree at that moment and said, you shall no longer bear fruit from this day forward. You have the same power in your mouth, in your heart, when God has given you the command, the authority over all the powers of the enemy. You have the power to speak against every unclean spirit. 
every spirit of doubt, fear, and unbelief. Every lie the devil has been speaking to you or your family member or your children or someone you know that you're associated with or familiar with, you have the ability to speak the word of God against that unclean spirit and command it to wither and die and dry up at once. The same power he told disciples that if you believe and do not doubt, you will be able to do even greater things than this. So many times when the enemy comes against us, instead of us rising against him, we, we receive his lies, we receive his packages he leaves on our doorsteps, we receive his reasonings, his mindset. So he comes with all this garbage and dump it on you. When he dumps it on you, instead of you recognizing this is not of God, you embrace it. How many times have you have not felt well in your body and you told yourself, I don't feel well? And the more you dwell on that thought, I don't feel well, you got worse. I've done that myself in the past until I got a revelation that death and life is in the power of the tongue and a man's belly will eat the fruit thereof or whatever you speak. So when I speak to myself, and I tell myself, self, you're not well. You got a headache. You got a migraine. Guess what happens? It magnifies. It gets worse. It gets bigger than what it really is. Because I gave it the power. I gave it the authority to overcome myself. So then it happens. We are going to get sick sometime. There are times we're going to find ourselves in a position where things are not going to go well. But we got to keep standing on the word of God, no matter what the enemy speaks against you. Because God's word, it takes precedence over all the lies of the enemy. And the devil cannot stop you from fulfilling the call and the purpose God has on your life. When his disciples marveled and asked Jesus how, was, how he was able to destroy the fig tree with just a word, he said to them, in essence, if you have faith and do not doubt, you can do the same things that I have done to the fig tree and even greater things than this. St. John chapter 14, verse 12. We have already established that faith is the gift of God, so we know that we have faith. It's Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. We already established that we have faith in God because faith is a gift from God. But doubt is a choice. Doubt is a choice. It is the devil's warfare tactic against our minds. Doubt is a choice. Since you can choose your own thoughts, when doubt comes, you should learn to recognize it for what it says. No, thank you. And keep on believing. No, thank you. And keep on believing. The choice is yours. Unbelief is disobedience. Unbelief is disobedience. When, it, when they came, it says, and when they were come to the multitude, there came a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falls into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to, to the I disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples of Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And he said to them, Because of your unbelief. So in other words, what Jesus said to the disciples, why do you lack faith? When he said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, why do you lack faith? Why did you doubt? That's what he's talking about. And so because of that, he says, because of your unbelief, he said, that's why you weren't able to cast out the demonic force in this child. We have the power in our hearts and in our mouths <coughs> excuse me, 
the word of faith to overcome anything the enemy brings our way when we stand on God's word. Remember that unbelief leads to disobedience. So Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 through 20. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 through 20. Perhaps Jesus had taught his disciples certain things to do in these cases, and their unbelief caused them to disobey him. Therefore, they were unsuccessful. In any case, the point is, is that unbelief, like doubt, will keep us from doing what God has called and anointed us to accomplish in life. Would also keep us from experiencing the sense of peace that he wants to, us to enjoy as we find rest for our souls in him. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Amen. So unbelief and doubt works together, and they both will cause you to fall short of operating in the anointing to do what God has given you the ability to do. So if the Lord tells you that you are to step out in faith to start a business and yourself gets in the way and you begin to doubt that, that's when you find yourself falling short of the glory of God, where you never walk into the full purpose what God has called you to do in the life he has created for you to live. A Sabbath rest. A Sabbath rest. Let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter that rest of God and know and experience it for ourselves that no one may fall or perish by the same kind of unbelief and disobedience into which those in the wilderness fell. It's talking about the children of Israel. God told them they failed to enter to his rest because of their unbelief. And what he meant by their rest was entering to the promised land that God has established for them to attain. But because of their hearts were prone to do evil and turn from their love, turn from God, they followed their own desires and ended up not ever entering to the promised land God has given them. So they end up dying off in the wilderness and their children, which was the next generation that were coming up under them, are the ones that were able to enter to the promised land that God has promised them. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. If you read the entire fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, you will find it speaking about the Sabbath rest that is available to God's people. Under the old covenant, the Sabbath was observed as a day of rest. Under the new covenant, this Sabbath rest spoken of is a spiritual place of rest where the believers can abide. So in the Old Testament, Sabbath was a physical place of rest, but in the New Testament, Sabbath is a spiritual place of rest, where you can rest from all the things of the world. You can rest in the presence of the Lord and don't have to worry about anything else around you that affects or takes place in your life because you're secure and you're abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. It is a privilege of every believer to refuse to worry or have anxiety. It is the privilege of every believer to refuse to worry or have anxiety. As believers, you and I can enter the rest of God and stay there. When Jesus rose from the dead, he sat down at the right hand of the Father in majesty on high. And guess what? So did you. You sat down in a place of rest to where the old nature has been put to death and the new man has come to life. So now we're living in the fullness of the new life in Christ Jesus, which should govern, which should be guided, should be led, should be driven by the Holy Spirit to a place of peace and rest every day of our life. Careful observation of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, reveals that we will never enter to that rest except through believing. And we will forfeit it through unbelief and disobedience. Unbelief will keep us in the wilderness living, but Jesus has provided a permanent place of rest 
one that can be established only through living by faith. So unbelief will keep you in a wilderness mindset where you're always wandering away from the Lord's will, his plan, his purpose, his steps for your life. You'll always find yourself walking in a place of darkness. But also the promises of God that he has for us is in his word. And it's up to us to believe the word of God, stand on the word of God, hold on to the word of God, feed on the word of God, and be established in the word of God, live by the word of God, because it will shut down the spirit of doubt and unbelief every time you have a personal conviction to choose to make the right decision to shut out fear, doubt, and unbelief. Living from faith to faith. Living from faith to faith. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So it's a requirement as a believer in Christ Jesus that you must, you have to. It's a divine order to live by faith. The only way you can always be standing and guarded against unbelief and doubt is when you're walking in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, standing on the word of God, keeping the word in the midst of your heart. Don't let it depart from you. Joshua chapter one, verse eight says, keep that word in you. Speak that word to yourself. And the word will begin to keep you secure and keep you walking in the promises God has for your life. I remember an incident that may drive this point very home clearly. One evening, I was walking around in my house trying to do some household things, and I was very miserable. I did not have any joy. There was no peace in my heart. I kept asking the Lord, what, what's wrong with me? I often felt that way and, sin and sincerely wanted to know what my problem was. I was trying to follow all things I was learning in my walk with Jesus, but something surely seemed to be missing. <clears throat> About that time, the phone rang, and while I was talking, I thumbed across a box of scripture cards someone had sent me. I really, so I wasn't really looking at, at any of them, just flipping around, fl flipping them around while I was on the phone. And when I hung up, I decided to choose one at random and see if I can get encouragement from it. I pulled out Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the experience of your faith that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound and be overflowing, bubbling with hope. That is a powerful scripture. You need to put that in your library. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of your hope so fill you with joy, all joy and peace in believing through the experience of your faith that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound and be overflowing, bubbling over with joy. I saw it. My whole problem was doubt and unbelief. I was making myself unhappy by believing the devil's lies. Check this out. She says, I was making myself unhappy by believing the devil's lies. I was being negative. I could not have joy and peace because I was not believing. It is impossible to have joy and peace and live in unbelief. It is impossible to have joy and peace and live in unbelief. So you got to make a choice going to make up your mind and stand on that word. Because you stand on the word of God, the word will secure you and keep you. Make a decision to believe God and not the devil. Learn to live, <coughs> excuse me, learn to live from faith to faith according to Romans chapter 1 verse 17. If the way of the righteousness of God is revealed, that is the way of righteousness of God revealed, the Lord had to reveal to me that instead of living from faith to faith, I will often live from faith to doubt to unbelief. That's good. That's good. 
Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, that is the way the righteousness of God is revealed. But it talks about from faith to faith. It says, the Lord has revealed to me, instead of living from faith to faith, I will often live from faith to doubt to unbelief. Then I will go back to faith for a while and later return to doubt and unbelief. Back and forth, I will go from one to the other. That is why I was having so much trouble and misery in my life. I hope you caught that. I hope you caught that, my brother and sister, because so many times, that's exactly what we do. We masculate back and forth from doubt to faith, doubt to faith to unbelief. And we keep on doing this, and we find ourselves in a state of mind feeling miserable, feeling unloved, feel like God doesn't care about us, no one's checking on me, no one calls me, I feel alone, I feel abandoned, because all those thoughts will come into your mind from the enemy when you give thought to fear, doubt, and unbelief. Remember, according to James chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and never receives what he wants from the Lord. Remember, key point, double-minded man is unstable, unsettled, never resting in all his ways and never receives what he wants from the Lord. So make up your minds that you would not be double-minded. Don't live in doubt. Make up your mind. You would not be double-minded and don't live in doubt. God has a great life plan for you. Don't let the devil steal it from you through his lies. Instead, refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets us up, up against the true knowledge of God and lead every thought captive and purpose away captive and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Second Corinthians chapter five, I mean chapter 10, verse five. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse five. So you gotta make a choice that I'm not gonna give in to the spirit of doubt, unbelief, be double-minded, live a wayward lifestyle, have a mind that's always leaning on to the reasons and the fleshly desires, but I'm gonna trust God in his word that he has the ability, he has the power, he's able, he's capable of keeping me secure as I stand and trust at his word. Because when you trust God in his word, his word will not return to you void. God promises that every word he spoke over your life, he is able to perform it. He'll bring that word to pass in your life. Every prophetic word spoken over you, you got to believe it without a shadow of a doubt and keep holding fast to the confession of your faith that God, what he promised, he's able to bring it to pass in your life. And I guarantee you'll find yourself living a more fruitful and abundant and a free life in Christ Jesus. So we're going to close a little early tonight. I'll pick up on chapter 12 next week. Don't want to start until it's a really great chapter to deal with, dealing with anxious and anxious and a worried mind and anxious and a worried mind. So you have the book, The Battlefield of the Mind, on page 100 in the Kindle version. I'm not sure what it is in the regular book, but you need to study this, this book. Study this book because this book is really giving insight and giving you the strategies and the plan of how to overcome your enemy in your life and in the struggles and the things that you're dealing with, how to build you up in your faith to overcome. So Lord God, tonight we thank you for this word. I pray you have not fallen upon deaf ears, but the word will impact, will strike a blow against the enemy, oh God, shut his down his voices, shutting down his voices and the lies spoken against the people of God and set them free in their reasonings in their mindsets and their attitudes, that everything about them will line up the word of God. We thank you, O oh God, that the word will convict us to want to change. It will convince us to change and will empower us to change. And I thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, asking you to forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly. 
Forgive me, O oh God, and wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord God, that you're able to save me and deliver me and set me free. And I receive it by faith that it's already done in Jesus' name. Now, fill me with the Holy Spirit and with power, and that with power to become a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, my brother and sister, stay encouraged. You're welcome to the family of God. Know that God loves you. He cares about you. And he's on your side. And he's there for you to keep you holding on to the promises that he has in store for you. I posted a link on the on the uh, 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 chat tonight that if you want to sow a seed into the ministry, feel free to do so. Every seed goes right back into the ministry for materials what God wants to do to, to help us to overcome, to give us knowledge, give us wisdom, give us insight, give us understanding, you know, because I take my time to do what God has struck me to do, and I know that God is able to perform every word. If you sow a seed, God is going to bless you double fold. You don't sow a seed, God's still going to bless you. I believe it. I speak blessings and favor over all your lives tonight, that every precious promise God has for you, he will bring to pass in your life. So, Father, I thank you tonight, oh God, for your presence, O oh God, I thank you for what you have spoken tonight, O oh God, that the word will not fall upon deaf ears, but manifest in our hearts, O oh God, that we'll be more and more like you every day as we purpose to walk by faith and not by sight. Until we meet again, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all have a blessed and extraordinary night, and know that God loves you, and so do I. So do I. Shalom. The peace of God be with you. God bless you.